Greetings, loved ones. Welcome to Sustaining the Movement, Elevating Black Artists. It's a pre-show conversation to launch, not a moment, but a movement, episode two, Black Nourishment. Uh, presented by Senate Theater Group in partnership with Wasp Village Theater Company and the Fireless Time Festival. I am Bruce A. Lemon Jr. I am co-artistic director of Wasp Village Theater Company and the co-director of Black Nourishment, along with Tyrone Davis, the associate artistic director of Center Theater Group. We are elated to share this work with you and share the digital stage with these tremendous Black artists, storytelling through spoken word, murals, and music. Hailing from Cleveland, Atlanta, Oakland, and Los Angeles, and exploring what it means to be nourished as a Black person in America. The art we make and have the pleasure of experiencing is the sum total of a huge collaborative effort. Many hands shape, shift, and influence our works in progress throughout the creative process. And elevating Black artists is the work of the champions on our panel today, and we want to amplify their work. So please, welcome to the digital stage, the creator and founder of Cast Black Talent, Courtney Peck. Hello, Courtney. The creator and founder of First 15, Jamila Webb. Hello, Jamila. And the director of industry initiatives from the Broadway Advocacy Coalition, Zylon Levinson. Thank you all for coming through. Uh, Zylon, thank you for coming through. We really appreciate y'all taking the time to be here. Uh, please, um, can we uh, go around and just uh, share with our audience a bit about who you are and what you do to elevate Black artists with your work and organizations? Uh, how about uh, we start with you, Gordon? Yeah, hey, uh, my name's Courtney. I started um, an organization called Cast Black Talent last summer. Um, it's geared towards um, creating and amplifying opportunities for black actors. Um, during the pandemic or the start of the pandemic, I saw a lot of casting directors doing um, casting challenges on Instagram. Um, and when the death of George Floyd happened, a lot of them shifted to, towards um, posting Black Lives Matter content and it felt very, some of it felt very performative. So I found, I was thinking of a way of um, how can they help their community, like Black actors within uh, the theater and the TV and film space. And I started uh, Cast Black Talent for a way um, for them to help black actors who are hurting during that time and yeah so uh it started with uh doing free casting workshops with one-on-one -on -one. um i reached out to a lot of casting directors they all uh gave their time and their support to the black actors that way and then i uh got in contact with wme and we did a virtual reading um, of katori hall's hurt village and um, we have the cast were um, established actors like or established uh, people like uh, Snoop Dogg and Laura Devine, J. Alphonse Nicholson, Jaquina Kalakango, and the other half were up and coming people that you probably don't know their name. But um, so it was a chance for us to uplift those people with the help from like Snoop Dogg and Laura Devine. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Yeah, and right now we're working on creating other opportunities like showcases and other virtual readings just to get uh, people out there. So, because it's hard right now during the pandemic, a lot of black actors who are up and coming, you know, we kind of like, we we need to network and meet, meet people and we're kind of stagnant right now. So Cast Black Talent is providing that opportunity for them. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Uh, hey, I just wanna say I'm happy to be here amongst this amazing panel. Courtney, I saw their reading, so shout out. It was re really, really, really beautiful. It was really beautiful. Thank you. Yes, I am a Jamila Webb from St. Louis, based in Los Angeles. I am an actor, producer, and I created First 15, which is a reading series for black and brown actors and writers. And so what we do, we hear the first 15 pages of writer's scripts, and they're read by professional actors. And then we have industry writers give feedback. And the cool thing is, seeing writers who are black and brown get like feedback from folks who look like them, right? And they're in these rooms that that that, they, that our writers wanna be in. And we have a nice mix of like new actors and new writers and then like established actors and writers. And I really created it because I just wanted a community space where we could convene and we could just be ourselves and tell our stories 
without, you know, well, you know, if you want to sell it, you need to say this, you know, without all those filters, just to know that we can be our authentic selves and tell our stories without uh, being, you know, reeled in. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, Jim. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I'm so honored to be uh, speaking with you in the company of these awesome, amazing uh, people. And um, yeah, I just love that we are all a part of this moment together. So I just wanna express gratitude there. Um, so I uh, am the Director of Industry Initiatives for the Broadway Advocacy Coalition, which started about five years ago. Um, our founders were a group of Black artists in the uh, company of Shuffle Along that was on Broadway in 2016. And uh, at the height of a kind of artistic excellence that they were feeling in their personal lives, there was this kind of socio-political reckoning um, happening in the country with the deaths of Philando Castile and Alvin Sterling and Sandra Bland. And there was this sense that there is a disconnect between the work that we're doing on stage and the way the world uh, is responding to Black bodies right now. And we as artists feel like we need to respond. There is a Broadway for every single cause except for a Broadway for Black Lives Matter. And so it was out of that sentiment that this organization got started and the work that we have come to do now is about centering artistry and the stories of those directly impacted by racist policies uh, as a way of creating space and building capacity for organizations and individuals who are trying to fight anti-blackness um, in their workspaces. And we, oops, sorry, there's some noise happening. Um, and we are in the spaces of the criminal justice or what I'll say the criminal legal system and also Broadway. And so a lot of our work is trying to connect the two. Um, and one of our flagship programs that does that is our Theater of Change course that is out of Columbia University Law School wherein we put professional working artists in a room with up and coming law students in a room with uh, folks who have been directly impacted by the criminal justice system who are now advocates most of them who have been formerly incarcerated. And we go through a process that's about what does it look like to create art with all of these different perspectives in the room with the eye towards policy and impact. Oh, that's amazing. Wow. Wow, well, I mean, that's necessary. Amazing. Um, wow. Uh, you look Bruce speechless. I really, 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 really <laughs> did. You know, it's, it's the... It's the bringing. It's the the part about bringing everything all together because, you know, it's there's there's an element of uh, an attempt to. And the, there's a personal experience, and then there is uh, your personal experience in this industry, uh, and there is uh, an attempt to separate the two. But it's really hard. It's really hard to separate the two because we're a whole people. You know, where like the the Bruce that's walking down the street is no different than the Bruce that's on stage. You know, so to separate those those worlds doesn't doesn't necessarily work. Um, so uh, hearing about ways where we're bringing uh, the artistry and the actual uh, efforts to uh, to work on the, the, the our experience outside of the stage, uh, it's just, it's good to hear. It's good to hear know that that work is happening, important work is happening. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, my, my next question, uh, we, we all know that representation matters and I'm, I'm looking for a, a story here. Can you pinpoint and share with us a moment where it really mattered for you? Uh, Tyrone and I were talking about this the other day and realized that we had two um, shared experiences uh, with uh, separate productions of August Wilson's Swim of the Ocean. It was the, the first play that I had ever seen on Broadway. I went to a preview and I remember sitting there I'm, and I'm watching uh, Felicia Rashad on stage and I see her hand that was shaking the entire show uh, and like the focus that I imagine it took to maintain that throughout um, just uh, in, inspired me a lot and seeing this, this black cast telling the story of black people on this stage uh, on Broadway was something that I had never seen before. Uh, and it really cemented in my head that there was a future possible. There was a path forward to find myself on a stage somewhere telling a story that mattered to me. Um, and I have, 
tons of these experiences in my life where I was able to see myself on stage, but it came out of seeking that out. Uh, it wasn't really brought to me. Um, and I'm wondering for all of you, if you can share with us a moment where that representation was was a, was effective for you and, and really propelled you forward in your life in the arts. Well, I can share a story of when I realized I wanted to be an, an artist, an actor. Mm -hmm. And that was when it was middle school. Uh, I, I, like I said, I'm from St. Louis. And fortunately, my mom, you know, we would go to the St. Louis Black Repertory you know, from sixth grade all throughout uh, high school. And I saw, but this was actually, a, you know, a, a school trip to see Inchishaki Shange's For Color Girls. So I saw all of these beautiful black women, different shades, different sizes, and they were just all on stage performing. And I was just entranced. Like everyone else was talking, you know, cracking jokes, but I was like there. <laughs> and I said to myself, I was like, oh, I really want, I really want to do that. I really want to do that. But I'm not, but I didn't tell my parents at college. So it was in that moment though, but because it was a, that representation, it was seeing you know, black women on stage that I had, that I was like, oh, I can do this. I can pursue this. And I did, year, you know, later, but it was just seeing them, seeing images of me on stage and just so many different, uh, telling so many different stories in that moment that gave me hope. <laughs> because before I had never even thought about that. That wasn't even, an, an, I think I wanted to be a farmer which was weird too, you know? I think I want to be a farmer or maybe there's a moment I want to be a heart surgeon. But it was in that moment, I was like, no, I want to I want to act. I want to perform. I want to tell stories. I want to be a storyteller. So that was my that was my moment. Beautiful moment. Yeah. Beautiful moment. Um, I would say mine is when I, I feel like there's so many, like you said, that have so many examples in my head. But I guess the moment that was like, I want to be an actor was when I saw in seventh grade and why I saw Jennifer Hudson and Dreamgirls because, you know, we, that was the first time I guess I saw someone before they were an actor because when I was younger, I used to watch her on American Idol. So I was like, wait, that's the same girl. Like, I guess I pinpointed <laughs> and I saw her trajectory of what, like her, uh, her I guess of how she uh, came to where she was at that moment. And that really impacted me. But before that, I would say it was like Raven Simone and That's a Raven and like watching the Cheetah Girls. And that was like, oh, these, they're, they're more than, like Cheetah Girls had like two black girls. And that's the first time I saw like more than one black person on stage or on TV and screen. And I, I didn't have to be like Scary Spice or something. I got to choose who I wanted to be like when I played dress up or uh, whatever with my friends. So that was when I realized that representation matters. We love the Cheetah Girls. Yes. <laughs> their names. Um, for me, like everyone said, I could name a billion things, but I guess I'll, I'll pinpoint a couple of moments in my life that are actually super localized. Um, one is being in fifth grade, going to a performing arts elementary school and being cast as a short, chubby black Aladdin in my school's production of Aladdin. And like completely changed my entire life. Um, from that moment I said, oh, I wanna be making theater forever. And so from fifth grade on, that is what I've wanted to do. Um, and because at such a young age, someone told me that I can be anything that I want to be, um, that surely affected like the way in which I move in all aspects of my life. Um, and so I just think it's like really important representation, yes, but also representation at a very, very, very early age, like everyone's uh, pinpointing. Um, and then when I was 15, I accidentally was, uh, just strolling uh, channels at my grandmother's house and ran across the PBS premiere of Spike Lee's recording of Pat and Strange, which uh, is my favorite piece of art, period. And um, as someone who primarily worked as a director now, I think that work showed me, not only can I be anything I want, I can make 
anything that I want. Um, and so, yeah, those are just two examples. That's fantastic. I'm glad that for the, the four of us collectively, we can all pull from so many different examples where the representation has mattered. But I come in contact with so many, so many, uh, so many youth who don't have all those examples, who haven't had all these examples, and then friends of mine that I, that I grew up with my in my own neighborhood uh, who didn't get the same examples or the opportunities that I had. Um, so it's kind of a one or two of us out of the bunch will get that will get that attention and get that representation. But the question that's always been on my head is, what about the rest of us? How do we how do we make it so it's not so it's not an exception to the rule. Like I don't want to be an exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. um, so I always wonder what what is it that we can do to to change that? Which is uh, which is the work that you've all been doing? Um, can you uh, from your your starting point? Uh, some of us as actors, uh, uh, Jalen, uh, with you as a director, um, you also all do mu multiple things. You're mu multi hyphenated. Uh, Going from the origin of your work to what you do right now, uh, can you mark the like the pivot point? Like, like Jamila, what what brought you what brought you to do the work at first fifteen specifically? Coming from an actress point, you know, real talk. I love game nights, and so I felt like this was an opportunity just really to bring people together not to have games, but just, I just miss that, that you know, I used to live in New York and I just miss that feeling of just congregating, right? Of fellowshipping, of reading work. So I just started that because I just know so many dope writers, so many dope actors. And I'm like, why don't we see each other like on a regular basis? Why, why you know, you can be in LA and like years ago, but I ain't seen you in like two years, where, where you been? Right here, same same neighborhood. So I, I wanted something that was gonna be you know, monthly, and that's what First 15 is monthly. We have a season like, you know, theaters, you know, September through June. Um, but also I feel like I went to grad school and there was just the, the idea where everything was separate. Acting was separate, directing was separate, like the play, you know, everything was separate. And I'm like, but we work in a collaborative industry. <laughs> so why are we separating those things? And so I just wanted to also meet more writers and, and pick their brain. How do you how do you create these you know these stories, and and also it wasn't like I was seeing like the stuff I was auditioning for. I just wasn't excited about it. You know, it wasn't it wasn't like why I got into this. So this was just a way to be like, okay, well, how about we can just uh, we can get some new stories put out there because what we're seeing is not giving us the vastness of what it means to be black, what it means to be black in this country, what it means to be black in this world. Okay, so okay, that's you. where it came from. Um, I, I could go back a little further uh, before I started with BAC because it kind of dovetails into it. Um, but in 2016, when I moved to New York, similar experience that I'm sure a lot of artists had with responding to what was going on in the world, just being like, what the heck can I do? And I remember like after Alton Sterling's death specifically, um, I just felt like rendered speechless and I could talk a lot. And so the fact that I like had nothing to say, um, my roommate at the time was like, Jalen, what do we do? And I was like, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. And I went to sleep. And the next day I woke up and an idea for a kind of event uh, came to me, which was to have a bunch of artists that I had met read words of other artists and activists um, who had gone through this before. And so it was a real kind of trying to answer a personal question, which is like, I have no more words. Let me find people who had words. <laughs> um, and from there, we created this event called Words on White, where we just gave the audience vocabulary to talk about what was going on. At the end of the program, instead of having like a traditional talk bag, we rolled like a 25 foot long white canvas on the stage. And we just threw markers and crayons and color pencils and all that stuff on this floor and made everyone go on stage and just respond to the canvas. And I think what we found was there's this kind of like technology embedded in the artistic practice of like drawing something 
wherein you could have a lawyer on his knees and a 13 year old black boy on his knees at the canvas. And when they look up at each other, the space in between their eyes is radically different than any other space in which they would meet each other. And so the idea of like, what if conversation started there kind of came to uh, me and my collaborators mind and then we decided to turn this one event into a kind of campaign. And so we would go to Central Park and we would go to churches and we'd go to schools and we would do words on right there and uh, kind of do guerrilla street art uh, around some of this. And then eventually uh, the founders of BAC heard about what we were doing, invited us into their official um, program. And then I just never left. <laughs> I just never left BAC. And so I've been with them for five years, even after the work of Words on White. Yes. Uh, Courtney? I'm um, sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, what, what made you start Cast Black Talent? Um, from, your, from your beginnings as a, as a performer, what, what brought you into Cast Black Talent? Yeah, um, I started it because I'm an actor. <laughs> And um, I, I graduated college three years ago. And you, you know, you like, they always tell you it's going to be hard. <laughs> you don't know how hard it's going to be <laughs> until you actually are in it. Um, but yeah, it was, just, it was a struggle after college because you try to find an agent and you do all this stuff and you look at the rosters and they have like, two black people, two black girls, and they're like, oh, already have someone of your type, even though the black girl's like 30 years older than you. <laughs> um, so it was, and just, yeah, and I founded Cast Black Talent because I feel like we need to get rid of those excuses from, we have, we have to stop accepting those excuses from the industry um, and to, call them out. I call people out on, I, I don't call people out specifically, but I use my <laughs> Instagram as a tool to, um, to tell people, white people in the industry, uh, things that we're going through. Like uh, a recent post that I did was about colorism in the industry and about how when you watch all these Netflix shows, all the black girls are like, lighter than the paper bag most of the time. And um, Gina Davis recently did a report about how like there's only 19% of dark skin actors on TV. So I feel like this is a moment where people are listening um, and to give them a space in which they can do something about it as well. Good, good. Yeah. Um, do you have any memorable responses that you've had uh, to your work? From our, from the community, from colleagues, from the world. Yeah, yeah I would say with the Hurt Village um, virtual reading, it was nice because I felt like it was the first time a lot of people saw theater because it was in their homes. All they had to do was log in uh, to see it, and it was more accessible because they they know Loretta, they know Snoop Dogg, so it was. Um, I, we got a lot of comments, like it was live on YouTube. So a lot of people are like, oh, I'm in Memphis. Like they, they're like nailing the accents or doing this or doing that. Like, I feel like this is my aunt, my uncle. So I felt like that this was an opportunity to make it um, accessible to people who don't live in New York and don't live in LA and don't travel to those spaces. Um, and that's what's uh, one of the not beautiful parts of the pandemic because there's no beautiful parts. But um, we're making it, uh, make, be, make, making things virtual has opened the door for people who don't have the opportunity to see these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, embedded in some of the technology of the theater change is the um, hope that in telling the stories of those most directly impacted, through the stories, we can understand the ways in which systems are at play and the ways in which policies show up in everyday life and in the ways in which that person speaking their story is an expert in all of those things. And recently in our last cohort, uh, there was a young woman whose uh, husband was in prison. And I think before she was carrying quite a bit of shame around figuring out how can she participate in this work, and also balance like 
her own personal feelings about a relationship with this person and, um, you know, the current legal status. And through the course, there was a, a day in which she was like, I feel so empowered to use my story, not for shame, but for empowering myself and understanding that I am the exact right person to be fighting this fight. And um, I think realizations like that make everything kind of worth it for us over at BAC when uh, those who are most directly impacted um, are not only told that they matter, but actually believe it. And you can see that there's a particular change that happens that affects the way they do everything. You know, there have been a few instances where people have just told me after reading how just they saw themselves you know, in those characters and how grateful they were. Also, uh, writers have gotten jobs. They've like, like, like things that have been shared. They've been able to now work with people to, to get that short produced or to, you know, work with someone else. So I always get excited when people share like, oh yeah, now I'm collaborating with this person. And I'm like, yes, that is what I want. <laughs> okay. That is what I want. And so, you know, actors have then uh, been on Pete Chapman, he, uh, him and his writing partner, they were going to have a short film in the fall, but because of COVID, they turned it into a podcast. And so we did a reading of it last June. And then the actors, a lot of the actors who were in that reading, they then, they were hired to be in the podcast. And I'm like, yes, this is, this is my, part of my dream of like, of it going, you know, from the, from the script, but also it getting produced and people just being open to like, oh, there's all these talented actors and writers out here. Folks just haven't been doing the work. <laughs> like it's not like, oh, where are they? They they they're here. <laughs> There's a plethora, and so uh, it's just been like actually creating. I mean, producing the work that we've heard, and 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 people like you know getting getting paid from it, you know, for their labor. Nice, nice. You know, invariably when someone says, "Oh, we couldn't find anyone," y'all thought you weren't looking. Yeah, exactly. You you weren't looking. You weren't trying. <laughs> Uh, we, we mentioned a couple, a couple of, uh, of, of pivots that happened uh, during the during the pandemic or reacting to the pandemic. Um, the, the accessibility that uh, that uh, is in existence now with theater going into people's homes, uh, bringing in that new audience. Uh, can you talk about any ways that your work has shifted or even evolved during this pandemic? I know there's no beautiful moments about a pandemic, but there are some there the there is a, a change that has happened that. Um, that I think we can bring a lot to into the future from a lot of things we can't we shouldn't let go of because it, it just helps us communicate and tell stories uh, better more efficiently. Um, but let's talk about some ways that your work has shifted or evolved during the pandemic. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the obvious thing is that everything is on Zoom, um, and so like big questions like how do you create community on Zoom? How do you uh, make sure people's needs are met on Zoom? How do we navigate the work that we're trying to do knowing that people are all over the world and have different bandwidths uh, in the way that they're dealing with this time? And also like the technological bandwidth of like Wi-Fi and that dropping all the time and just like the very kind of technical, practical changes that have had to happen in this time are big, but I think some of the gifts that have come out of them are being able to call in more people into the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. um, to not have to be so centralized in whether, wherever you are. So even in my freelance work as a director, it's been so exciting to be able to be like, you know, blah, blah, blah is in Ohio, but we could just call him and see if he wants to do it. You know, that's so thrilling. And that's something that you don't get to do in normal times at all. And to just be able to have a wider span of, communication with your community to realize that it's bigger than just where you are, but it's also small enough that we can all be heard in some kind of way uh, has been really exciting to, to see in the work. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the, I don't know, the formal are, uh, rules about like, don't cold email, don't DM. I have gone out the window because people are home. <laughs> so I guess um, it has made um, everyone just more accessible and um, people who 
like when I first started Cast Black Talent, I started like messaging a bunch of people and asking them to share it. And people who probably like uh, a year or two ago would be too busy or probably wouldn't even check their DMs were like, yeah, sure. And they repost. And that's just starting relationships with people that uh, I thought would are uh, were out of reach before. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just have to echo what uh, Jalen and Courtney said. You know, First Fifteen started in March of 2019, and then April of last year, we just moved to online, and we'll basically stay that way in the future, you know, and then have, like, maybe full readings in person. But because I can now get actors who are in New York, who are in Uganda, who are in the Bahamas, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot going on right now in this country, and people are like, I don't think this is a place for me. I want to leave, but I still want to do my art. They can still, you know, write and 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 have their work read and have uh and, and and perform, you know, do a reading. My parents are able to listen in and also finding ways to make it more accessible, just like having the live transcript or making sure. Uh, I mean, I was at a reading. We have I haven't instituted yet, but I was at a reading where people actually describe what they looked like to help those who are visually impaired. So I'm just even. I want to even find more ways to make it more accessible to, uh, you know, differently able body people, right? If, if there's hearing it, uh, um, issues or vis visual issues. So I've been excited about this online space. Of course, I miss, you know, being in person, but it has opened up a lot of, a lot of uh, new creativity, I would say. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And accessibility, uh, it's, it's more than just um, uh, being able to log on and see a show. But it's absolutely about um, who has accessible Wi-Fi. Uh, um, who is who, who? Who is viewing? Do you have captions, or is there is there an ASL interpreter? All these things that are very easy to apply to this digital medium. You know, at this point, it's it's more. Did you not think about it, or do you not care? <laughs> because it's absolutely possible to do. Um, and the more that we do it, uh, the more it becomes normal. The more that it is just there so nobody has to ask for it because their needs are already being met. Yes. We can, we can do that. That that's a that's a that's a beautiful thing that I hope many of us are, 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 are the artists out there are, are picking up to just fold accessibility into your work um, from the from the jump uh, because it's it's necessary and uh, your audience needs it. So yeah. give people what they want. It's just normalized too like when you go on TikTok people everyone's just doing um, closed caption these days for like every video, which is great. Yeah. 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 And uh, talking about your, um, what are your, what are your goals and um, what's the vision of your of your your organizations or initiative? Like, what is it? What are the things you really that you're laser focused on making happen? And where would you like to see it go? Yeah. Sure. Um... With BAC, you know, sometimes we can dream so big that we're like, okay, now let's pull that back and figure out what we can really achieve, what is really possible. But I'll just give you, like, honestly, the big dream for me personally is that um, the organization contributes in pushing the industry into a space wherein the active work against anti-blackness becomes what becomes a crucial part of what it means to create work in this industry. Um, so in the same way that there is someone in a rehearsal room who knows every equity rule and can make sure that those rules are being abided, there's someone there with the capacity to create a space if ever there is racial harm or violence that finds its way into a room as well. Um, that we not only normalize uh, giving money to just certain initiatives on certain months, but that at any moment in time, a cast can ask of its audience, hey, we need you to give us resources because we care a lot about this issue. And to support us in this way is to support us in all ways, right? And so like just all the little ways that we embed uh, centering anti-Blackness and the work um, I think is part of my big goal for BAC, that it just becomes normal, like wearing a seatbelt. I was yeah. joking. Yeah. Really? 
you know, you're like, wow, those are really big drinks. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, get these scripts produced. <laughs> Those are big dreams. <laughs> well, yeah. So ultimately, I, you know, I see First Fifteen as like this incubator of this awesome amount of talent. So I want just to have the funding to just be like, all right, so we're gonna shoot this. We're gonna shoot this in the summer, right? There's no like, hey, we gotta do a song and a dance. You ain't gotta do that. This is a, this is a beautiful story that needs to be told. We're gonna we're gonna shoot it. Let's go. So that's that's what I ultimately want. Yeah, um, I would say Casbah Talent similar. Um, we want to, I guess, um, our, our long term goal is to help Black actors become multi hyphenates to create work for themselves, um, for us, by us. Um, yeah, and just making it so they're just calling calling the industry out more about like the rosters and making sure that when black actors come out of college, they feel supported, that they don't feel like no one's <laughs> there for them, no one's looking out for them, just uh, being a resource for them. Yeah, especially coming out of a, of a training situation where you may have felt that nobody was there for you in that setting. Mm -hmm. uh, what I hear from everybody that I talk to in, an, in, a, in a, currently in a BFA or MFA program, and they got the same stories that I got. They got the same yeah. stories that my got. You know, I went mm -hmm. 10 years ago. It's, and it, it hasn't changed. Um, so this is how we change it. Yeah. yeah. So so what's next? How can people get involved with your organizations? Yeah, you can, uh, we we have a website, castblocktalent.org. You can reach out to us that, there or uh, DM us. We're always having um, events and programmings coming up uh, in, the, in the next few months. Yeah, so I would say follow us as well. We have, um, casting workshops that we do that are going to be open to the public. Yeah. Yeah, you can follow us uh, online at www.bwayadvocacycoalition.org, bwayadvocacycoalition.org, or also on our social media platforms. Um, and you can sign up to be a part of our artist impact team, which means at any moment we may call in uh, someone from that list to help us uh, mobilize some action. Yeah, definitely. You can become a fan. You can donate at first15la.com. Uh, you can, uh, you know, follow us on Instagram, on Twitter, looking for actors. And you can submit, you know, as an actor on the website. You can submit as a writer on the website. We actually have our next reading May 16th, Sunday, May 16th, 3 p.m. Pacific. Uh, Kimiano Catino, the writer on P Valley, and then Felicia Pride will be joining. And we have three awesome scripts by, uh, you know, Black women. And then in June, we're going to highlight, you know, our uh, BIPOC LGBTQ writers. So if you have a script, go ahead and submit on the website, first15la.com. You can find everything there. And if you got some coins, drop them. Great. So after after everybody drops the coins in there and everybody uh, floods your Instagram and, uh, and your inbox and gets involved, what can we do together? Let's, let's get into some visioning, some visioning to the future, what we can do together as we all come together, like we all know each other now, so we all can do something together. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I'm like perpetually thinking about what are the connections between people and things. Um, and I think that like there is our community of, of black artists specifically, we do not lack resources. We, we lack maybe the ability to have access to all of our superpowers, right? But like we were talking about with COVID, there's the possibility to connect to Jamila, even if I'm in New York, there's a possibility to connect to Courtney. And I think what we realize is when we get into the rooms that are for us, by us, there's nothing that can stop us, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really about decentralizing where we have or where society has thrown so much influence Right, my case it can look like Broadway, which is an industry I, I, I work within. But you know, what would happen if we, as a collective uh, group of Black artists, said we're actually going to throw our influence over here, where this little theater is working on this project, where this collective is trying to reimagine casting, where these people are trying to find a production team, 
Um, there's no rules anymore. We're in wild, wild west. It's a perfect opportunity for you to just get the dopest black people you can find and make your dreams come true. Um, and not just in terms of the art that you want to make, but in terms of the way you want to make it, right? Like, however I'm envisioning the world, there's someone else who's out there envisioning the world like that. So like, I would advocate for people to just be able to talk about the way you want to be in the world, because someone else will hear that and be like, ah, those are the words that I needed to give me the courage to also do that thing, you know, and they'll reach out and now you have two people. And what we know is where two or more are gathered. <laughs> you know, the big dreams, what's the, what's the, the uh, according to Jamila? Oh, my mind was already percolating. I was like, "Ooh, okay. So, look, we gonna do we gonna do a script about you know the legal system, okay? And then like, I'm gonna get the actors from Cast Black Talent, okay? And then Bruce is gonna do like open it up with some spoken word, like you know, I, my mind is already gone. It's gone, okay? So we'll just we'll just keep talking about it afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way. I was like, oh. Uh, with the multi hyphenate thing, I was uh, I was going to reach out to you already, Jamila, about uh, doing something together. And I've reached out to uh, Broadway Advocacy in the past because I feel like you guys are doing so much uh, great work. Um, just like yeah, continuing to let the connections going because we shouldn't have to rely on the industry or the white industry. Right. We we can like network across. Absolutely, yes. absolutely mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, I'm reach out to both of you just to say and yeah. have more time to connect. And this is recorded, so. Yeah, yeah it's on record. <laughs> on record. Yeah. 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 Right, right, we all heard that. You don't see something coming in the next year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. nudge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. sure. Uh, we just have, we have, uh, we all have the responsibility to uh, reach out to each other and, uh, and, and motivate something forward. Do you feel a responsibility uh, as black artists to continue creating that path for future black artists? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Daily, you, you muted. Oh, sorry. I said it, it's embedded in the definition of being a black artist. Yeah. If I was you're like, not it's passing it down, you're not even doing the thing. Mm hmm. Because I yeah. didn't get here by myself. Someone helped me, you know, even reach this point of realizing, oh, of wanting to create this space of, of creating First 15. So I, I love talking to, uh, you know, actors who are just coming out of, 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 of school or, or thinking about going to school or writers. So I, yes, yes. Yeah. With the accessibility thing, we like we realized it doesn't have to be hard to reach out to someone, to connect with someone. Um, yeah. And hopefully the, uh, people are seeing that and people who are in college or high school and making it easier for them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Can you, can you uh, drop some names or remember if it's who, who's made space for you? Who, who's, who's helped create that path for you? <laughs> no, I was like, which one am I going to say? Because then the other one yeah. was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this, this isn't everyone that has influenced you and made a path for you. But just just who can come in come in right now. <laughs> Name all if you can. I'll, I'll just say this. Um, uh, taking it from the, the perspective of someone who uh, is a colleague, I think sometimes we think of like people like way up there who reach way down and pull us, which totally happens and has totally happened to me as well. But I remember, you know, just kind of bring CTG into this. Uh, my first equity gig was at uh, CTG doing the Christians, and I understudied um, an actor named Larry Powell, and um, I had just graduated college and I was understudying him. I was much, much younger. And I remember the first time we met, he gave me the biggest hug and said, I saw you in my dreams. I knew that it would be you. I never met this person. So I was like, whoa, that's weird. And also, can I follow you everywhere? <laughs> and I kind of just like, he kind of let me follow him everywhere. And so much of the connections I was able to make my first year out of college came from just like being around people who like to be around me. And um, the, the kind of, favors and the kind of just grace extended to people
people who are right there on your level, um, but have just enough more experience than you to like watch your back has really been some of the greatest inspirations and leaders in, in my life. And also the Fireless Time Festival who was presenting this event. You know, Larry told me the moment I get to New York, go to the Fireless Time Festival open mic. I went there my first week in New York and everyone that was there that night is a part of my story in some way. To playwrights that I've worked with, directors I've worked with, actors I've directed, you know, I've had my work in the fire this time festival. I've been a co-producer there. Like it's it's the community. Everything is community. Um it's so, like yeah, those are just a couple of uh, folks. Yeah, um I would say the black people who reached out to cast black talent, um, Tyrone from Center Theater Group, he reached out um when he saw the virtual reading. Um Johnny Webster from Throughline Entertainment. Um because, you know, during last year, a lot of people were getting hit, hit up for jobs. Uh, they, could have, they could have had, uh, oh, they're too busy for other black people. But I really, um, so I really respect the people who uh, help, were helping us uh, with the groundwork with Cast Black Talent before people knew who we, we were. Yeah. There's so many names. So, but I will say uh, Kimberly A. Bear who is an actor and also the artistic director of the Black Rebirth Collective has been so helpful, just amazing and very supportive. And she's a fellow, you know, Black creator. So I do want to shout her out, but also there's just been so many, Kimiano Katina who works, you know, with First 15, uh, you know, some of my teachers at, you know, ACT, even though, you know, I didn't like their evaluations, but they, you know, they did, they did bestow some knowledge upon me, like Stephen Anthony Jones and Gregory, Gregory Wallace. So they're just so many. And I'm happy to have that because some folks unfortunately don't. Someone was just telling them, no, 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 nah, you, you sure about that? And I feel like so many people have said, no, yes, keep going, keep going. Absolutely. And we are all collectively saying, no, yes. Yes, keep going, keep going, keep going. And encourage you all out there, black artists out there to reach out to these three. Absolutely, as soon as you can, uh, get involved. Um, do you have anything that you want to plug real quick while you got the air of the world? Or at least this audience that you have coming up? Anyone? Yeah, I mean, next month, you know, First 15 is back Sunday, May 16th. You know, like I said, we're gonna hear three scripts. Felicia Pride, Grey's Anatomy, Queen Sugar, and Kimiano Catino, P Valley, uh, Step Up High Water. They're going to be giving feedback. You can go to the website to RCP. The readings are free. So, yeah, we're going to be doing um, a workshop, a healing workshop, uh, healing uh, from rejection. Because <laughs> there's a lot of rejection uh, for actors. So, um, t uh, just, I guess, uh, follow us on Cast Black Talent on Instagram to, yeah, see when that's going to be. Heal the people. Um, I, and for fear of like <laughs> not naming something that I should have named, I'll just repeat: <laughs> go follow B Way Advocacy Coalition um, and, and see what we got going on. Um, and then just follow me. Always doing random artsy parts stuff. Um, so have a <laughs> premiere of a comedy special I've directed that is tomorrow called God Is a Comedian. So look that up. Yes. And uh, have a fun time with yourself. Absolutely, looking forward to checking that out. Well, uh, folks, it is uh, it's we're about ten minutes from the premiere of of uh, Black Nourishment. So we want to thank you all for joining us tonight, and I hope you stick around and, and tune in. It begins streaming for free right at five p.m. on the ctgla.org um, slash Black Nourishment page. And if you're watching on YouTube, it'll just take you right to it. Uh, and it'll be free throughout the month of April in recognition of National Poetry Month. So go get those words, y'all. Everybody, you can take a quick break and come back at 5 p.m. for the premiere. Uh, grab you some goodies and get ready to take in all this nourishment. I want to thank my panel again for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, let's stay connected and let's keep working. Thank you. Yes, yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.